you miss most of this event. Enjoy it and think. Remember, the translation and interpreting are always going to be necessary, but we have to find a niche in this evolving market and this evolving society. Thank you very much. See, 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 out there. Okay, so let's move on to the seminar. <coughs> bien, bien, bueno, nos han echado flores, los intérpretes, los problemas técnicos, los pobres que están luchando. O sea, vamos. Muy, pero... Ay, ay.
ya está buenos días buenos días bienvenidas bienvenidas good morning welcome Y aquí no he puesto nada. Este es el 2. Ah, no. Welcome. First of all, I want first to thank you for the attendance. And it is a true honor to be here sharing this panel on institutional and legal translation. In this round table, we are going to. to deal with the relationship between what's professional and what's academic. The professional part is translation and interpretation in international organizations in Europe, both European and national ones. And the academic part is the relationship between training, research and curricular design as well. Besides, we're going to deal with questions such as where do we want to go with training? Where are we heading? It is similar to what our Dean has said, beyond training. That's why today we have several professionals that are top ones. I want to thank them and I want to welcome them for being here today. The order is going to be as follows, 15 minutes maximum for each one. And we have tried to divide the parts into different blocks. First of all, Miriam Garcia de Leaniz, and secondly, Manuel Feria Garcia. The second block is going to be uh, presented by Fernando Prieto Ramos first and Guadalupe Soriano Barabino second. I'm going to introduce Miriam Garcia de Ilianiz. She has been working for 30 years in the field of translation. And the last 21 years have been devoted to translation in the direction general of the European Union and I'm underlining what she sent she said that she enjoyed working for the uh, direction the work she performs there is basically to translate and read and edit uh, texts from English into Spanish mainly she has a degree in law in the Operta University of Catalonia. She has a degree in Arabic uh, language and literature in the Autonomous University of Madrid. And she has a diploma in foreign trade. She has a diploma of higher studies in specialization regarding translation in the prestigious school of translators and interpreters in France, in Paris, the ACID. So I therefore give the floor to Miss Miriam. Thank you very much for this kind presentation. In the end, this is all about translating and translating well. 
I don't want to uh, go beyond my time, so I just want to say that my interest is to encourage you to be able to be translators in the DGT. We are translating more than ever. We are translating non-stop. The machines are there, they're threatening us. But I'm focused on uh, institutional translation. This is part of our work. I'm going to uh, carry out, I'm going to try to project the presentation. I'm going to carry out a quick uh, presentation, a quick introduction to show what the DGT is. Can you see it all right? Shall I enhance it? I'm trying to get full screen, but I can't. I can't have it. Si quitamos esto, igual podemos aquí. Sí. Vale, perfecto. Vale, pues muy rápidamente. Very quickly. Ok, that's ok. First, I want to clarify that the relevance of languages in the European Union is enormous. We saw the linguistic regime in 58. In the access of the member states, there would be four official languages. We have 27 member states, 24 languages. It is still very important. But the Commission enables, through the regulation, to choose the languages that they work with, and the Commission works basically in German, French and English. But all of the languages are official languages and they can, we can work with them. We see how the evolution has taken place, the linguistic regime. And a slight representation, a, a slight introduction is the linguistic service of the Commission. Each institution has a linguistic service, but the DGT is the biggest one. To give you an idea of it, last year, 2022, 1,400 translators translating 2.6 million pages. There's a part in Brussels, there's a part in Luxembourg, 54 in Luxembourg. Since the new languages started, Luxembourg has uh, more relevance. I'm speaking about the 10 Eastern members, it was kind of a revolution. The number of women is higher as well. And we have 70% of translators and 30% is support staff, horizontal task, um, etc. This is only to show you the uh, huge size of the translation elements in the European Union. The Department for Spanish Languages has a unit that coordinates is the zero one. There are people in Brussels and in Luxembourg. We have Blanca here, who is the terminologies, terminology coordinator, and Jose Luis, who is the director. And we have in Luxembourg, myself, and in Brussels, the other unit. What I'm trying to show you here is that apart from the enormous uh, relevance of the translators, is the diversity of topics that we deal with. In Brussels, we deal with agriculture, climate, economics, finance, law. But in Luxembourg, we have more technical topics, fisheries, uh, transport, health, companies uh, of all kinds, uh, um, industries, etc. So this gives you an idea of the amount of topics that we deal with. The language of the originals in 2022 was clearly, clearly English, 90, uh, more than 90 percent. So we still uh, translate in English. English is the most relevant language. Why? Because most of the um, workers have English as the main language and they draft in English. 
So in spite of the Brexit, uh, English is still very important. So having said that, translation in the DET, why is this called institutional translation? What is this thing of institutional translation, may, we may ask? Well, because it, the context is an institution, the European Commission. So what are the features of this kind of institutional translation? It is an anonymous type of translation, first of all. The translator, unlike other translations, we do not know who the uh, translator is. It comes from the GT and it is a collective work that is performed there. So there's a cascade fashion uh, way to work. We very rarely start from scratch. We have an instrumental uh, element here that is important. The goal is that the institution and the commission uh, performs the tasks correctly. It has a very specific and determined way of working with the international style, a terminology, a phraseology that is special. And this helps us achieving kind of a language, a structure, a specific form. All this without saying that this is literal translation, because this may lead us to believe that it is a word-by-word -word translation, the minimal unit is still the sentence. So it is a translation <coughs> that is very faithful to the original, more faithful than in other fields, but it has no aesthetic nuance. And the intention is that the Spanish is fully understood as an original version. But we uh, see that it is fully adequate to the goal that has been uh, entailed. I show you this graphic here to uh, illustrate the relevance of legal translation within our field. This is all we do. 54% is legislation, which is basically the um, the uh, connections to legislation related to regulations, recommendations, etc. All the different legal acts that are performed in the Commission and in the Union are translated there. And a part of the graphic is a different type of translation, which is an institutional type of translation. It is more of a dissemination type, communication with other institutions, etc. Having said that, the dissemination part in, intends to achieve dissemination of policies and it also performs f a, a, being faithful to the original, being clear. It is the same type of translation I was performing 25 years ago when I was a freelance. And what we intend to have is a loyalty to the text, a text that is readable in Spanish and that is natural. The Commission has several campaigns regarding this. We started with clear writing campaigns so that the, the uh, writers, those who write text, would do it more clearly so that we reach the citizens. And at the moment, the Commission is relaunching the campaign because the idea is to reach them the clearest way possible. And we have the other part of this graphic, which is the legislation part. Legal translation we do, of course, but it is mainly legislation what we do there. We require uh, searches, like any other field, uh, searching terminology uh, for the phraseology as well. And what we basically do in this regard is to uh, perform um, legislation, uh, translation in legislation. We are essential for the legislation process. Translation is essential because at the same time that we translate and edit, we analyze the documents. So translators do have a say in mistakes, inconsistencies, etc. So we're lucky enough to work in touch with the authors, with the writers themselves. And we could move to other languages, the uh, doubts that may be there, the mistakes that may be made. We work a lot in common with the writers, with the uh, authors of the text and with the rest of the languages. So this is essential. Translators produce 23 out of the 24 versions, but they are as authentic as the original. And this is very 
interesting and very particular and peculiar in the union because we are fully responsible for the texts they are enforced in any language so if there's a mistake in one text we have to change it and solve it because it will be transferred to the other languages and it is binding translations are as binding as the original so it is applied in 27 different uh, systems legal systems and that's why terminology is so important there has to be coherence in terminology we have to avoid synonyms when a text defines a concept we cannot then amuse ourselves by changing the synonyms the synonyms etc we have to be fully faithful to the terminology that we're using and the one that has been used before and the text <clears throat> concerning the current legislation this is essential and this is to show you that the legislation is essential I'm going to stop here for a minute. Uh, the main difficulty is the legal nature of the texts. So when I arrived in the European Union in the DGT 21 years ago, I had not studied any law at all. And as I arrived there, my boss suggested to do it. And I realized how important it was. Muy útil. Si no... And this is one of the most important things that I've done. It's very useful. And we have to know very well the procedure, the legislation in the union, who does what, how does it work. Translating a legislation text without knowing how it works is very complex. So the nature of this text, combined with the complexity of this type of technical language, is the main difficulty, I believe, we can find in this department both the terminology and the legal uh, discourse uh, uh, pose difficulties and the problem that i find is that there is a risk between knowing the law and the legislation etc and not knowing the one related to the european union yes. because we not always find a relationship that is direct between the concepts and realities of the legal systems there are sometimes concepts that uh, comprehend more things, that in, uh, embrace more things. If they uh, translate the original term in Spanish, we may be making a mistake because there are nuances that we have to take into consideration. And quite the contrary, if there is a term that includes something that is the same thing and we invent a new one, there's an, uh, an absurd situation that we're facing because there's no relevant elements that is real so we have to find a happy medium there at first i was connected to the spanish legislation but this is not exactly the same thing so this balance between what is included in a concept in spain for instance one of the terms that is more uh, controversial is intellectual property intellectual property in spain is something very specific and industrial property is a different thing the law on brands talks about the industrial property in spain it is very clear but if we move to the european environment or even the international environment as, at large and we see that the term in english for instance intellectual property includes brands we bought protects brands so how do we translate that intellectual and industrial property, as we have done, there's a, there are documents that suggest this translation. Or if, if we are in the European environment, I translate intellectual property and I'm including there brands, models, etc. This is something that in Spain, it is included in the industrial framework. So entering this area is the more complex part of legal translation, in my opinion they are binding the legislation is binding and is part of the european union law we need to respect it so we have to be careful we have to avoid mistakes this is precisely when we see the maximum fidelity to text we cannot uh, forget the quality of the spanish of course but it is true that in this type of text we have to 
maintain what the original text is saying. We have to include nuances. It's not a matter of translation word by word. We have to get the meaning out of it, all the nuances downloaded into Spanish. And this is where I believe that we find the most difficulty. It is true that we increasingly have more translations. We also have um, accept more packages on translation. There are neologisms in transport, in energy. Those are the fields that I, I am more familiar with, at least. A lot of legislation is being included, and we have plenty of tools and resources. Tools and resources are wonderful. We translate with SDL Trado Studio. We have translation memories that are 30 years old. They are fed, they are corrected. We have a norm, a standardized memory with the terminology, with all the models, etc. It, it makes our lives easier, definitely. We have terminological basis. Blanca will tell you about that later. Any document that we create, it is created with a terminological base. Neural machine translation. Be careful with that because it is wonderful. It's something that actually seems to think, but it is very deceiving. Be careful with that. We have to be alert because otherwise uh, we can make mistakes. Uh, the more sophisticated it is, the more we forget about checking. The legislative models are also very important. This is an example on the screen at the moment. We have kind of a skeleton with English and Spanish drafted by uh, the writers. And this is provided to us. Hay tanta investigación detrás que todo esto lo único que hace es facilitarnos la vida y a pesar de todo. It's phraseology, it's new concepts, it makes our lives easier. But in spite of all this, we have to take into consideration that there are several elements to be considered. Here we have the punto y coma bulletin, the IATE uh, database. We have all these tools that are essential that makes our lives uh, easier. But we have to search and research a lot. And all this is to tell you that the DGT uh, is a very nice place to live in. We work a lot, but we have tools that are wonderful, resources that are wonderful. And we have a very interesting type of translation. We have a quite, uh, quite a variety of texts to be translated. We have an important legal background there to be taken into consideration. So it is good to know about law, at least European law. Thank you very much for your attention. By the way, I would prefer to answer many questions later, so do not keep the doubts in mind and just tell, that, tell us uh, about them. Thanks a lot. So now I will give the floor to Manuel Carmelo Feria Garcia, who is a senior lecturer of Arabic since 2007 translator and editor in the UN in Arab and Arabic and English since 2010, in official interpreter in the uh, courts in Malaga, 92 to 97, a legal translator from 94, author and coordinator of many uh, books and publications of all kinds on translation from Arabic. Mahmoud Tirwish is one of the uh, Algebri are the authors that he has translated. He works with legal translation and for the institutions as well. Welcome, Emmanuel. Yours is the floor. Good morning. Thank you very much for your physical or virtual presence. I want to thank the organizers, of course. I want to thank the members of the panel. I will also try to be as brief as possible so that we can have time for discussion. First of all, I'm not going to speak about the basic elements of legal translation because EUN is quite similar to the European Union, so I fully subscribe anything that has been said before. So what my colleague Miriam has said is fully correct. This difference, well, before that, I would like to say that I'm going to try to focus 
on what is the relationship between legal translation and the translation at the UN, in practical terms, of course, and with reference to the differences with the European Union, but this is going to be very uh, brief. You know that the main difference is, of course, the number of languages we work with. We work with English, French and Spanish, Arabic, Russian and Chinese. Those are the languages that we work with. There are not so many, but the variety is much bigger, of course. For instance, non-Indo-European languages with legal traditions that are not the type of law that we have in the European Union. So it is not a matter of European Union versus Spanish law. There are there's a multitude of traditions in law in the UN, and in the case of Spanish, we don't even speak about the Kingdom of Spain. We speak about all the Spanish-speaking world, and this is a big difference, of course. Legal topics are dealt with in the UN in general, universally. They are present there. But there are certain differences in, for instance, I'm not, not going to introduce the UN, you know everything, all the information about it, you can look for it in, online. But the thing is that there are two main headquarters one in Geneva and the other one in New York, as you know. Depending on the headquarters we're talking about, uh, there are important differences according to the topics that we deal with in the documentation and therefore translate. Legal translation, translation, no doubt, is much more present in Geneva than in New York. In New York, we translate a lot of the documentation that is generated generated in the institution as such. So therefore, we're speaking about budgets, etc. And the terminology is, is the UN terminology, as we call it. In Geneva, we deal with legal topics much more in Geneva, we, uh, I would say it in the plural, because I was, I'm part of it as well, we devote ourselves to uh, human rights more than that. Why human rights issues are translated in Geneva? Why is it more present there? First of all, because of the national reports that we receive. Many national reports are translated when a particular state is within a convention they have the obligation of presenting a series of uh, follow-up reports where they explain the things they've changed, the measures that they've taken, what are the initiatives that they have, they have followed, etc. So we try not to say the same always, to adapt the legislation and the practice and the application in relation with the application of the Convention itself. These type of texts are long and they are full of legislation. I wanted to um, emphasize what Miriam said. This makes a big difference with the legal translation by a legal translator. I've done that myself for many years. Very rarely a, a sworn translator or, or interpreter translates so place this, but they, there could be some part put in a judgment, but it is more accidental. So normally they do administration, civil registry, economic, etc., contracts, etc. But not necessarily we quote as much legislation as in this past particular case. It's the same thing that happens in the European Union. Many national reports are just a full list of legislation. Sometimes you start, the state has started a series of initiatives to harmonize the internal legislation with the stipulations of the Commission. For instance, civil code, Article 20, 227, etc. 328, 329, etc. There's a lot of legal translation in the national reports. Then we have other types of documents that are similar to a judgment. 
although the terminology in the terminology we intend not to make it look like a judgment so we maybe not call it resolution or decision etc so that we uh, not make it uh, court wise so to say but they are similar to judgments these are the communications there are bodies that are specific for that i'm i'm, I'm sorry i think I'm, I'm i'm losing a little bit track of my of my train of thought I'll start again. If somebody believes that the uh, fundamental rights have been curtailed and that there are no internal resources in the state to resort to and they cannot go any further in the legal system of the country, they have the ability to introduce a communication to the bodies that are uh, incumbent. And in this communication, the mechanism as such provides a resolution. It's kind of a judgment, but we call it resolution. So we take the legal nuance out of it. In that type of judgment, the legal content is uh, quite big. I just said that to provide you uh, with a couple of um, examples and the presence of the universal uh, legal elements is almost almost universal. So speaking about legal topics is almost saying nothing. As the colleague said, one thing is the intellectual property and another thing is the constitution. So the documents in the UN will have a, an impact a bigger relevance in some disciplines or on some legal topics, depending, of course, on the type of document and the type of body in, uh, in the UN where the document is uh, presented or introduced or the one that issues it. In estas decisiones de que, que os comentaba, esta especie de sentencia, hay una gran eh, presencia del derecho procesal como en cualquier sentencia, claro. También de derecho sustantivo, pero en particular de derecho procesal. Si los documentos son, por ejemplo, informes nacionales en donde se habla de la Convención de los Derechos del Niño, los derechos, en fin, ya sabéis que los niños se supone que tienen derecho, ¿no? En todas las partes del mundo. But, also, but we'll find more elements of labor law with explanations of working conditions, the length of the working day, etc. And of course, constitutional law, international public law, of course, and international humanitarian law. I think these are in general the topics that I, as a translator, have found to be most uh, frequent. Legal topics are more common depending on the language combination too. I'm going to talk about English and Arabic because that's my language combination in, with Spanish, of course. All the documentation that the organization publishes is in English. 90 something percent of all the texts are translated from English. These are texts produced by the UN itself. They don't uh, have a clear reflection of, of different uh, legal systems because they're texts produced by the UN itself in English. But if we think about the translation from Arabic into Spanish, the situation is different because the document documentation produced 
uh, by the UN is never in Arabic. It's an official language, but it's not a working language. So when we translate um, from Arabic, we're not going to translate the UN budget. There are many, many more international um, reports. Translation from Arabic um, is almost uh, all focused on national reports. So really, translating Arabic in the UN is legal translation, legal legal translation and uh, legislative translation as our colleague said and lots of legislation with regard to terminology we have the same problems that miriam mentioned but of course adapted to the idiosyncrasy of the eu and because we it's not only the EU and the different member states legal systems, the UN, of course, um, is uh, an organization with the, the member states from all over the world. So we're talking about a world organization and Spanish is not only Spanish from Spain. With regard to legal translation, we have to try to avoid terminology that is clearly linked to Spanish uh, used in Spain. So we would never use terms that are only used in Spain because there are many other Spanish speaking countries in the world that are UN members. This has another dimension. It means that there is a wide range of legal traditions that uh, are reflected in our translations the procedural regulations of the, the ex-Soviet Union, um, family law in the Islamic countries. Um, they're not necessarily all in Arabic, those texts, of course, because it's not only the Arab world, Nigeria, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, and all this generates problems. To deal with those problems, we try to make uh, the terminology as uh, wide as pos possible, so using hypernyms, talking about, for example, a prosecuting body rather than a particular name of, of the body, um, talking about a uh, warrant or... And we talk about assistant for decision making rather than guardian or um, <clears throat> because there are similar terms in Spain and other Spanish speaking countries that don't mean the same thing. So we have to use a uh, hypernym. And um, I think I'm going to leave this here now and uh, we'll leave the rest for the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Now we're going to give the floor, move on to the second block, which will seek to establish a link with uh, training. And we'll give the floor to Professor Fernando Prieto Ramos, who's uh, head of the Centre d'études en uh, traduction juridique of the uh, ETI in Geneva. He is vice dean. He studied law and translation. He did a doctorate in linguistics in Dublin City University. He has many publications and his research field is international institutional translation, legal translation, focused on specialized terminology and quality control. He has also been a translator for national and international organizations, including five years as um, a permanent member of the OMT <coughs> translation team. So welcome and thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I'd like to thank the DG of Trans 
Translation, the University of Granada, for inviting me. And thank you all for being here. I'm going to try and be brief. It's going to be, I'm going to try to be brief. It's going to be hard. Um, I'd like to talk about my experience in institutional translation. For me, I can't conceive re research without a link with professional practice. I'm going to talk as Well, I'm going to carry on talking without my PowerPoint. I'm going to talk as a researcher, as a trainer, but also as a translator, which I have been particularly for international organizations, with my speciality being in uh, legal translation. Okay, we in Geneva, and I think other um, faculties are the same. Um, training has to be given by people who are experienced. Therefore, research is in this virtuous circle of professional practice, research and training and research has to feed into the profession and into training. At the beginning, in the first part, I'm going to just briefly speak about the evolution of research and institutional and legal translation. It's a wide field linked to law and very variable of legal traditions, national jurisdictions, different aspects of law, different genres, functions and topics. So it's there's a very, very enormously diverse field for research. In the field of translation, there is a high demand, and this is constantly confirmed, not only at an institutional level, but in the private sector. If anybody wants to specialize in legal translation here, there are many students here, there is a high demand. Unfortunately, it's a field that is still associated to the need for quality because legal texts are sensitive, because they may have legal consequences, and it needs human translators despite technological evolution. It's not a coincidence, it's the only field that has a European um, directive on uh, quality uh, that Ulita contributed to bringing around. Um, the directive on the right to interpretation and translation in criminal proceedings. And this was important because the consequences were vital for uh, personal rights, individual rights, and it's a field with its own ISO standard. Apart from the uh, general translation standard, you have this one you can see on the screen, 2771.2020, an ISO standard specifically for legal translation. Focusing on on um, research, legal translation has an interdisciplinary the plenary nature because it's linked to comparative uh, law. It's um, increased uh, exponentially. It, it originally focused on the French speaking world for historic reasons, Switzerland, France, Canada, but now it's expanded all over the world to the diversity of topics when is, is, is uh, wide, as I mentioned before. But there is uh, an important focus on legal terminology because it's a distinctive feature that shows some um, reflects asymmetries between legal systems. And this is a problem for translators. And it's a field for research, the lack of equivalence and comparative legal analysis. Apart from that, which uh, 
articulates the common denominator of the main topics. There are other aspects that are increasingly frequent, such as teaching, technology, translation competence, and the methods are increasingly diverse and sophisticated. We mostly found, find corpus analysis. We work with texts, that's our raw material. So. That's the main research method, uh, corpus analysis, but increasingly we're seeing other approaches that are more ethnographic, observation experiments, interviews. There is an increasing trend to datification. I'm sure there are people here who have to do their master's project, and uh, I'm sure this rings a bell with you. We need data, data that can be validated and sustained in academic um, circles. And there is increasing cooperation with the professional world. I've been in this sector for 20 years or more now, um, and I've seen a radical change in the relationship for, with uh, the profession, because now all the corpora are at uh, everybody's disposal. Now I'm going to focus on institutional translation. Again, there's a wide range of genres. I'm talking about professional contexts. You will have heard of legal translation and court translation, business translation, contracts, etc., notary translation, everything linked to the movement of people and goods and institutional translation, which is a very wide field. I confirm with that uh, the legal paradigm is ideal for this because law is always evolving based on the previous legal precedents, and that's the same in institutions. The consistency with what has already been published by that institution. That's one, uh, <clears throat> that is one precept, and the other is um, accuracy. Even ambiguity may be used on purpose, so that also has to be translated accurately. We can't define a concept and then move away from it and be creative. And no, we have to work with consistency and with um, accuracy. These are the two main um, premises. I'm going to give you some examples I'm going to, of research going on, particularly with uh, uh, practical applications. I um, participated in Law 10, which was to put together resources for translating licenses for research programs. Nobody reads them, they click, but there were clauses that could even be illegal. And of course, the localization companies didn't don't specialize usually in legal translation. And this was very good for them. This corporate project was a cooperation with these localization companies. Qualetra was uh, uh, to design resources for translating key documents in criminal procedures. And now in the five or six minutes that are left, I'm going to talk about legal translation in international institutional settings, Letrint, um, which is a project that I have directed until very recently and deals with the scope, the features and the quality indicators of institutional legal translation. It's a huge project. Um, it uh, has been uh, expanded. It was the first consolidated grant given to transla a translation project in Europe, 2 million euros. And in the first phase, we tried to carry out a total X-ray of institutional translation. Everybody's very um, busy in in their institutions and we didn't have an overall empirical view and this is essential to know what we're teaching i was taught in my uh, legal translation classes 
that there were genres of national law, but that wasn't seen in that way at an international level, at an, national level, an international level, it was just legislation and treaties. But I worked uh, professionally mostly in dispute settlement. This is quasi uh, legal and I'd never seen that in class. I'd, uh, and then international law English, I'd never, I learned in common law English, which is an important reference, but I hadn't learned the other form of English. So uh, this uh, field has attracted more and more attention, but we didn't have a rigorous empirical and ambitious study. In the first phase, we wanted to carry out a mapping of this, what genres are were translated, what were the institutions devoting their resources to. Let's go be beyond this myth of legal translation. And to do this, we as representative institutions, we use the EU, the UN and the uh, OMT. The EU, because of its size, had more volume of translation, more languages as well. They have more translators working mm. for them. The common languages for this project were English, French and Spanish. We can collated all the texts that were translated and published in 2005, 2010, 2010, and we designed uh, a corpus. We did a total um, a scan, linced with a corpus with stratified um, sample of each main genre, depending on quantitative and qualitative criteria so that we could take more advantage of each uh, corpus. I, all the information is on the website of the project. I can't go into much, uh, much detail here. And I'm going to carry on until our, our, our moderator tells me to stop because it's interesting. There were um, interviews surveys, analysis of um, institutional texts. I'd like to thank Jose Luis for his cooperation in um, <coughs> sending out surveys. How could we do this comparative mapping? We needed functional categories applicable to each field. And after an analysis of this, we saw that what these institutions shared was the creation of law, law and policy making, um, implementation monitoring, and adjudication of the legal function. Um, the, the survey was sent to 24 international organizations. This is the representation of the key functions. And we also added the administrative functions because um, international institutions always need administrative documents. This is an overview of the results. Two or three years go into this to see this. The EU, as was said, has most uh, volume in lawmaking. We also covered the four main institutions, the Commission, the Council, the Parliament and the Court of Justice. And that's why we see adjudication in grey, legal function. And that's important because it's from the there's a lot of a high volume of, of work here in the court. And then OMC, OMT, we, OMC, we have monitoring. I've spent my life uh, working for international bodies. Mabel, Manuel spoke about the treaty bodies in the UN, spoke about individual um, appeals to the Human Rights Committee, which seeks uh, to maintain the rights of political and individual rights. This is what they do in most international organizations, translate um, country reports. And uh, so there's a lot of um, <coughs> national domestic terminology. It's not all 
and international terminology. Oh, I wasn't taught this at university either. Here we see the main functional categories, depending on the volume of translation, the creation of law, hard law, rather than soft law. And in the UN, the law that is generated is soft law. The most important are resolutions. And it's hard to apply this. There's been, look at the situation in Israel right now. There has been a resolution on the occupied territories for years and years and years, but it can't be implemented. The International Court of Justice in the UN doesn't offer a high level of uh, volume. Resoluciones. In comparison to the OMT, which is very important. Um, disputes settlement, as I mentioned before. You can find data uh, on the corpora on the website. I'm not going to talk about terminology either, because we did a whole scan here, a whole study of the term, the kind of terminology. I really wanted to do this because we know law is multidisciplinary, and when we translate a legislative, a legislative text, and this is the case in the EU as well, for example, on chemical products or some highly technological topic, we wanted to see how much translation there were of domestic legal um, concepts in this um, more technical and technological translation. It's an average of 40% is legal terminology, but a third is non-legal terminology. So w when you work in legal bueno, translation, you also have to have knowledge of other fields as well. It's not all legal. And uh, there are pub Applications that have come out of this about competence, about uh, different aspects which can be applied to both training and the professional world. So, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Now we'll give the floor to our colleague, uh, Professor Guadalupe Soriano, who's a senior lecturer here at the University of Granada. She has a degree in law and she has a PhD in, trans, in translation. She's a Swedish translator in English and French. She's participated in many national and international research programs. And she has, at the current time, she has uh, positions of uh, responsibility in the uh, University of Granada. She is a former coordinator of the master's program. Her main field of research are comparative law applied to translation, interculturality, and she has numerous publications. One second, I'm fighting with the PowerPoint. Thank you, Abdelatif. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation, Abdelatif. Before I start, I'd also like to thank the DG Translation for giving us the opportunity here at the University of Granada to hold this uh, uh, workshop. And I'd like to thank Pilar and Anna for organization. As Abdelatif said, I have, I've, <clears throat> I'm a former coordinator of the master's program, and so I know how much work there is, although I, I didn't have to coordinate a workshop like this. I'd like to thank uh, the audience. I'd like to thank the interpreters as well. And you know, I speak very fast. So if I go too fast, raise my hand, raise your hand. As you have just seen, my colleagues 
have spoken about uh, professional practice in the institutions, research, and I want to talk about training. Also, my colleagues have said on other occasions, oh, I didn't learn this in the university, etc. I'm not going to um, say anything new, I don't think. I, I would just like to provoke thought and uh, reflection, as Miriam said at the beginning. Um, she wants you to leave this room thinking that you want to work for the DG translation. Well, I would also like to uh, provoke thought and um, reflection. Uh, why are you being taught and how and to do and to be what kind of a translation? Universities are always being accused of being uh, far away from the profession, not taking it into account and that there's uh, a big gap between the professional worlds and universities. I hope that that's not the case. I don't believe it is. But uh, I don't really want to tell you my thoughts. I want to provoke yours, both those of you who are here in person and those online. For, before we talk about uh, uh, the legal translator, let's we have to talk about where legal translators work. My colleagues have talked about international institutions. I'm not going to go into detail about what legal translators do in each of the places they may work. But what I would like to emphasize is that legal translators or a translator of legal texts, I'm not going to get into that either, but we'd have to see whether legal, the adjective legal should go with the translator, him or herself, or with the work they do, the texts they translate, but I'm not going to go into that. Does, okay, so legal translators work in international organizations, but also in international and in national authorities, domestic uh, authorities in countries with more than one language, in business, in um, solicitors offices, they also work as um, independent professionals, they work in court. So there is a wide diversity here. There are some elements in common, of course, with regard to, to a legal translation and translator and the training they need. Obviously, everybody needs uh, translation competence in legal translation, in translation in general, and legal translation specifically. There are several competence models, one of them by F Fernando Prieto here, which say that apart from translation competence, a tr legal translator needs an extra element. In other words, translation competence applied to legal texts in this case. I've interdisciplinarity. Obviously, it's been very clear here that it's um, essential to be familiar with law, depending on the work we're going to do. Because of course, it's not the same to work in the EU, where we need in-depth knowledge of European law or work in the UN where you need an in-depth knowledge of international public law, etc. Or to work at a local level where you need in-depth knowledge of family law or another branch of law. And then we may also wonder whether training should be focused on training translators or translated or uh, training legal experts and linguists at the same time. And not uh, like in the EU where they prioritize training in law, but whether these specialists need both legal training and language training. I mean, I'm talking about uh, legal expert linguist, linguist in the sense of people 
having an in-depth knowledge of law, to what extent is it necessary for legal translators to have an in-depth knowledge of law? So what training do legal uh, translators receive? Uh, nowadays, we've seen some examples. There may be professionals who've studied law and then have they speak languages or they have gone on to train as translators through a master's program, an undergraduate program. There may be other professionals who've done it the other way around. First of all, translation and then specialized in law through a master's program or whatever. All these different combinations are possible. Even those who haven't studied law or translations, there are people who've studied uh, language degrees or linguistics, other degrees, and they've ended up in the world of translation and legal translation specifically because of fate has taken them there. I'm going to focus on translation at a master's level because uh, we are in a context of the ENT network and a professional master's degree. What characteristics in um, master's degrees are common? I've tried to compare a series of aspects that are present in all the master's degrees in uh, legal translation. There are very different uh, students. There are students that come from translation with an undergraduate degree in translation. There are students who come from other degrees, either language degrees or not. We have students with different interests as well, with different language combinations, with different knowledge of their working languages, even though we require a minimum. And even people who have studied the same degree, for example, translation, they may have a different background because translation is not taught the same in all universities. So I think there's a wide diversity and I'm sure the students here of our master's program know that they you have different profiles. So we start off from different places, <clears throat> different starting points. And we, and we have different kinds of masters. We have masters that are more specialized, for example, in institutional translation or legal translation, masters programs with specializations in legal translation, as is our case in Granada, and that have different objectives, as you know, I have just said. And there are also more general master's programs. Unfortunately, there's a characteristic that we find quite frequently, and that is rigidity of the university system. There is, it's very hard to adapt to change, and this is the case. In Spain, to change a syllabus, I think we need four, five years. Is that the case, Mercedes? Many years. So, by the time we react, the it's too late. And there are new challenges in the profession. On the screen, I wanted to reflect some of them. Also, linking up with the name of uh, this event, I didn't include the big beyond that Enrique mentioned, but there were some key turns that I think are important because they're indicators of the translation profession today and particularly of legal translation, technological challenges, diversification. We're speaking about legal translation today, but we're going to speak about others as well. We're going to speak about technology, specialized translation, accessibility this evening. So there's a wide variety of elements also in legal translation. My colleagues have just said it. Not only legal translation is interdisciplinary. As my colleague Fernando Prieto has said, it's multidisciplinary. Law is very wide, much more than we are told in the faculty, so we can imagine. And it is also a profession that is constantly evolving. I'm not going to speak about what our dean said at the beginning, if is it an instrument, etc., that is called computer. 
I, when I tell my children how I was working years ago, we used to come with the dictionaries to the exam, not so long ago, so it is not that long ago, I'm not so old. So it's a profession that is constantly evolving and this affects a legal translation as well, whether we like it or not. There are a series of features that should be mentioned. Last week, some of us shared another event organized by the EMT network in Salamanca, and there were a series of keywords that were mentioned. The uh, highlight was I, uh, in artificial intelligence. It was a very interesting element. Uh, there was an interesting conversation, and there were several keywords that were constantly repeated. Adaptability, flexibility, critical spirit, all these things are not new. Translators have always been flexible. They have to adapt themselves to the situation. There has to be, there has, they have to have a critical spirit. They are soft competences that in, increasingly obtain um, and achieve more relevance. And there's a new element, which is artificial intelligence. So maybe what we should think about is how these new challenges may affect the profession, how these may change the profession of legal translator. What is the impact that they should have on training? And the key question, is it still necessary to train legal translators? I have a clear answer to that. I think we all do. I have children in high school at the moment. They are science kids, not like uh, their mother, but they ask me, is it worth studying translation? Do you recommend it? Because I've heard that with machines, this will not be a profession anymore. So there's a process of affirmation and reaffirmation at the moment. It has been mentioned in the, the round table before. Luis mentioned it. It's necessary. We are still necessary. We are still demanded. Of course, we do have to study translation, of course. But are we ready? Are we ready to train professionals? Are universities ready to train professionals, the professionals that are demanded by the market? Rather than thinking about being ready or not, the, what we have to talk about is how to face the challenges. Universities are ready, of course. Do we still want to be further prepared? Yes. The key is the how. And there are a series of questions to be asked, according to this reflection that I am, I am inviting you to carry out here. On the one hand, maybe one of the answers is, shall we propose a more practical type of training? Shall we emphasize it in every single sense? Not only practical in the classroom, but outside the classroom as well. These uh, placements in companies, this uh, vicinity between the academia and the enterprise, the industry and the training institutions. Shall we create training programs? It is rigid to do it. It is difficult to do it. It is done. Of course, we do it. We modify them. But it is true that maybe it is not so easy to achieve it. Shall we or can we? No, thanks. Shall we or can we carry out a competence development according to the profile of the students? Shall we prioritize a type of training with regard to others? Shall we train those who have a background in translation already in a way and differently those who have a background in law, in uh, language and literature, etc. Shall we uh, require a more technological background and training? Shall we try to focus on artificial intelligence and what is offered by technology in general? Or shall we prioritize a more uh, translational type of training? intercultural competence, etc. There are 
a series of possibilities that should be mentioned as well to face this lack of flexibility that we witness in the university system. Maybe we should think about a tool that is actually more institutionalized, that is the micro-credentials. Micro-credentials are short courses that have always been done. And this was in the hands of the private companies, academies, etc. Now it is in. Uh, it is also found in the university. The university may create short, small courses that are easier to create. <coughs> and they enable us to be adapted to the to what is demanded. Another possibility is, for instance, projects such as the one commented by Fernando Prieto. Thanks to research, we take to the classroom the reality of the international organizations themselves. There are many question marks to be attacked. I'm going to try to summarize here. The conclusion I may reach, or my conclusion at least, maybe it's not the same one as you may have, but we do have to uh, become adapted to what the market requires. Maybe we need a paradigm shift. And this is the reflection I'd like to share with you. I, I am sorry I'm so abruptly finishing, but otherwise I will get scolded by the chairman. By the chairman. Thank you. Thank you for such a, a variety of information that we have received according to the topic that we have dealt with. And I want to thank you as well for using only the allocated time at your disposal. Now is the time for questions from the audience. How long do we have? No, we're running out of time, so we don't have that much. We're oh, sorry about the microphone is not being used. In this round table, probably there will be less questions, but the face-to-face uh, -face attendance can have the questions in the coffee break. Well, I think we can we can have 10 minutes for questions, okay? So go ahead. Thank you. The question is for Miriam Garcia. A couple of questions. You mentioned that translations, we in translations, we rarely start from scratch. Does, does it mean that the translation that is speak is divided in amongst various translators? And what is the profile? My second question on the to, to work on the DGT, to work in the DGT. We systematically translate act, actions that are based on previous actions and we start a background we start from background regulation it is very difficult to find that translation that has nothing to do with anything there are many referential documents we start from treaties then the uh, connected law to it any regulation any directive and connects to other directives etc so one cannot be abstracted from the fact that uh, this has been translated already or part of it for instance, terminology, we're translating a directive, then we have to go through the previous directives, the ones that are quoted in the legislation, etc. Any action that is related, even sometimes we have documents from the UN. There's a term that uh, we quote the, the child, and the child in UN is uh, under 18 years of age, but a child is also a young person. So we translate child children, it has to be said niño, and it should be minor in Spanish. Because those underage, it says niños and adolescentes, which means uh, children and adolescents. So we have to say that because we have the Convention of the Rights of Children, and the documents have to be based upon the translation of the UN. 
It is very difficult to start from scratch when a, a thousand documents are quoted in the document that we're translating. If it is a letter, it's a response to a letter that has been sent from by some citizen. If it is a parliamentary question, we answer, we translate the answers as well. So there's always a context in which this is centered. There could be terminology involved if it's a new one, but there are always texts that are connected to it. And the second question that uh, you asked was, what are the competences that are needed for, to work in the DGT? Well, maybe Jose Luis or Luis should be better uh, um, candidates for the, for the answer, but uh, we uh, need a degree, a degree in any field, I don't think that it has to be linguistic. Of course, we're fostering the fact that it is linguistic because it has to do with the field. We also uh, appreciate uh, scientific uh, uh, knowledge, apart from linguistic knowledge, but the requirement is having a degree. And then you need a, an A language, the, your native tongue, the one that you normally translate to, and then the original B language is normally a language with C1, C2 level. And a second a European Union language. Well, the first one, it's best to be English, the first foreign language. It could be French, German, but English is better. And then the second one with B2 minimum level. No experience is uh, required at the moment. And uh, the most immediate thing is a uh, blue book and grants. Uh, this is five months grants that are provided to the students with, for uh, placements and practice. There's a way to have access to it through a, an exam. And then you are you officially get a contract after that if you pass it. And then an, uh, what we call the uh, opposition in Spanish, which is uh, the examination to become a civil servant and to be admitted as a full member of the institution. Uh, I don't know if I'm clarifying everything here. Is it okay? I think that you explained it very well. Maybe we can announce, and this is uh, something relevant because it has to do with the question, next year, we're going to publish new um, new exams for Spanish translators from the Commission, from the Council, from the Parliament, and from the Committee of Regions. So several examinations are going to take place, so you could opt for them. So it is a piece of news for those of you who do have the degree. And probably I would add something, because I think that the question is also relevant. A team of 50 translators, like our department, where we have to cover all imaginable topics and fields there. So you've shown the abbreviation of our 50 customers. We do need varied profiles. If we were alone, if linguists were alone, uh, this would be problematic. So it is important for us to have translators with legal training, with uh, financial, economic training, scientific and technical training. This is essential. It's very important. And we can then um, have everything uh, covered with that. Thanks a lot. So we move to the following question then. Pilar. Thank you very much. My question is for Guadalupe. You mentioned that obviously a translator, a legal translator, does need to, uh, to have competence in law. And you mentioned other topics such as uh, of uh, language and literature or philology. So what is the role of a philologist in this regard? I believe that rather than answering myself, 
I think that Luis and Jose Luis should be the ones to do it. But I believe that what's desirable would be that to translate, we would be trained in translation. But this is not always the case. There are professionals that have a different type of training. How do we move from philology to translation? There are two ways. Additional training to um, follow a master's degree. Or alternatively, two, it could be um, and or practice. In international institutions, I believe that any member of the panel can say more than I can say, but this is generally. Obviously, philologies are not aimed at translation, so you, you need to have this additional training. So uh, normally training is the way to achieve it and practice could also be. Yeah. As we have said, not only translators translate. Translation is an interdisciplinary type of field. To uh, do medicine, we need language, but we do need ability to understand the content as well. Jose Luis mentioned it. Anybody having a degree may go for the examination. But this uh, step has to be taken at a certain stage. You can be a doctor and speak the languages, and you can be a very good translator once you have taken this uh, step, this additional step. Thank you. There's another question here. I'd like to ask you about uh, automatic or machine translation. Um, first of all, how do you implement it? Is it something that is imposed like in the private market? Or you can choose, well, this, I prefer not to do it with machine translation or in posterity, but rather to translate it as such or this is good for this particular field and not for the other one? Is it flexible? And secondly, as editors, is it the same to translate or edit or post-edit a translation? Do you see a, an improvement in quality in others, in one and not the other? In each project we create, in the pre-treatment, we um, have machine translation but you can import it or not but basically we work on machine translation it is very difficult to open a segment and find it empty it helps a lot we've even carried out exposed uh, exercises to assess the quality with uh, machine translation even comparing uh, statistical translation with neural translation and there's plenty of problems uh, we have to pay a lot more attention. So you make the work easier, but if you have to edit, if post-editing has not been done well, you make it more complex. This is used a lot, but with plenty of care and attention, but it's part of our everyday work. The neural translation. We feed with our translation memories the um, the especially the English language pair is very perfected. It's, we see the context, we see the phraseology, and it is very useful. But at the same time, it's very complex. I don't know if I answered correctly. Uh, do we have any questions, Julian? So you're going to be the last one, because I promise that there will be coffee waiting for us. So we can have a last one. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, in this procedure or process of developing the regulation in 23 languages, in the European Commission, the question is if we start from from a specific document or is it done simultaneously in the different languages? We always start from one document, from one version. In this case, it's English. And then, very often, the uh, translations 
some met better than English because it is drafted by a native speaker and English uh, is different then uh, but in the beginning they're all original ones uh, or at, at least in principle there's an editing unit that normally uh, improves some texts the English department is increasingly uh, achieving that or doing that, but there's an editing unit that sometimes improves the texts. Yeah. Sí, quería simplemente. Uh, in relation with what the student uh, and uh, asked, uh, there could be several uh, translating Europe ones, but the, this data are important. The use of data for machine translation, the generated data with public resources. It is much different in institutional environments where we work and private environments. This kind of a, a trading with the data, the freelance translator is penalized because they are using translation memories and the industry um, discounts that, but it is generated with public resources. We all know that Google Translate, etc. they use the aligned resources of the commission, the regulations, uh, etc. So this is a very interesting um, discussion. The data belong to whom? What are, what kind of data are we operating with? Are they financed publicly or, or what? I don't know if this will be dealt with later in the seminar today, but this is one of the um, hot topics at the moment, obviously. No, uh, es una pregunta dirigida al profesor Manuel. Uh, this is a question addressed to Manuel. What do we have to do to become a translator in the UN? What are the uh, requirements? And one question for four, for the four speakers. We were attracted by the fact that many translators in the European institutions, probably not so much in the national ones, but the institutions, the European institutions and the international ones, most of them are not uh, former students from translation, but from uh, philology, French, English philology. We have a student, a, a conversation with Manuel before, and this was obvious. In view of the Toledo courses, because most of the professors that were giving uh, workshops there were, le uh, were providing training there were not a spe a specialists in translation. I'm going to try to be as quickly as, as quick as possible. Sometimes in these environments, I have the uh, since the feeling that we, of course, are focused on the um, environment of the European Union and the languages of the European Union. That are not necessarily only belonging to the European Union. And we tend to forget that there are other languages that have different speeds. So thinking about neural translation and even more uh, AI in Arabic, well, no, honestly, and I am mentioning Arabic because this is the language I work with, but this is it's a different speed compared to English, of course. And we have to take this into consideration because I'm not going to translate uh, the same way from English than from Arabic. In Arabic, I open word and I go back to the 1980s. That's word and that's it. So what do we have to do to be a translator for the UN? I do not speak on behalf of the UN. I have no authority whatsoever. I'm not a civil servant at the UN. There are no grant programs like the ones mentioned by Miriam and you go to the examination directly. There are languages that are so demanding that it's not so difficult to start uh, working as a contractor and being paid by the word as a freelance and you uh, are you have to be you, you are, are submitting a text uh, a test to, to see if you can be part of the team. All the information on the type of tests, etc., is in the internet. There are examples of examinations. 
no problem with that. You can find all the information with plenty of detail. However, I would also tell you that the exams and the tests change. Actually, they're changing a lot. The last one that I that was carried out in this section uh, for Spanish, the exams were done online. You were at home, you don't have to move from there. I'd like to say something before I forget. There's a very relevant difference in as much as the topic of the requirements that you have to fulfill. There's a basic requirement that we tend to forget because uh, it seems that the world uh, has only the limits of the European Union, but uh, to work in DGT or for DGT, you have to be a citizen of the European Union. To work in the UN, you don't need to be a citizen of the European Union. You can be a citizen of any state that belongs to the General Assembly. I am at your full disposal uh, during the coffee break. Thanks a lot. Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we, we have to leave everything for coffee, so uh, for coffee for the coffee break. So we we need to finish the agenda. We 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 need to finish. We uh, we have the uh, schedule with the catering people. So thanks a lot. And uh, before you leave, we will be back at quarter to uh, eleven. So we will resume at that time. Thank you very much. We will be back to that in a minute.